The bio-holocaust is real. The vast acreages that have been taken out of food production and are diverted to grow the feedstock for biofuels under the force of law have left a billion people in chronic starvation. Of these upwards to 100 million people perish every year in unspeakable agony. Almost the whole of humanity has become complicit in this greatest ongoing holocaust of all times, some in the name of profit, and some in the name of the earth, to save it from overheating with too much CO2 in the air. Both aspects are based on lies. The CO2 level is presently at the lowest point in 500 million years and is at a level where plant growth is already diminished by the prevailing CO2 deficiency. When greenhouse operators double the CO2 in their greenhouses, they get a 50% increase in plant growth. The biosphere is running in a starvation mode for the lack of CO2. CO2 is not a dangerous greenhouse gas, since 97% of the greenhouse effect is caused by water vapor and oxygen. There is no global warming danger as the result of human activity, for which people must be killed to save the Earth. The biofuels holocaust that is now killing 100 million people a year is totally unnecessary, as nothing is gained by it, except a flood of profits for a few. The greatest tragedy, however, is that society is collapsing its humanity, as it keeps on bowing ever deeper to the mandate of lies, to the point that society has become active participants, in the murdering of humanity, that pales the Nazi holocaust into insignificance, this means that LaRouche's illustration of the empire process has implications on a far wider landscape, than mere economics. If the economic tragedy, that has now gripped the world is to be ever healed, the wider landscape needs to be understood and be healed on the home ground. Our home ground has become deeply polluted with lies and inhumanities and subliminal impositions of the foulest sort. We cannot heal the economic tragedy in isolation from the whole vast landscape of deep-rooted tragedies that are all aspects of the system of empire that now nearly the whole of humanity subscribes to and has become subservient to. It is not sufficient to take one aspect in isolation, such as economics, to aim to stop the looting process with protecting laws, or to aim to stop the biofuels holocaust in isolation, or even to stop the enforcement of poverty across the third world. These have all been addressed in isolation. None of the attempts to solve those problems in isolation have worked. A breakout from the system of empire appears only possible when society pulls itself away from the entire landscape of tragedies and discovers its humanity on a higher level, on a level, above the quagmire, where the problems are rooted. This is the level that the German poet Friedrich Schiller labeled the sublime. He gave humanity its crown to wear, and with this crown Russia defended its freedom, even after Schiller himself was dead. And wearing this crown he composed the great poem, his ode to joy, that Beethoven later set to music for the ending of his last symphony. This video presentation closes with the finale of it. The crown that Schiller gave to humanity was not an empty crown. It was brought to Rush by one of Schiller's collaborators. It came to light as a powerful crown that defeated the mightiest military force of the time, Napoleon's force that attacked Russia. In 1812, Napoleon threw more than 690,000 men into the attack on Russia, of which just a few thousand returned. But while being defeated, Napoleon was rarely opposed, just harassed, while the logistics were denied that a human society requires. The supply lines were cut. Historians say that Napoleon was defeated by the Ice Age of the Russian winter. This is hardly the case. Napoleon only had 100,000 men left when he took Moscow unopposed. He had captured an evacuated city that had been emptied of all supplies. Sure, a few crazy battles were fought that gained neither side any advantage. The real victory was won by the crown, the crown that Russia had accepted that gave Napoleon the opportunity to destroy his own army. Being already nearly defeated, Napoleon settled down for the winter in Moscow. That's when Russian patriots burned the city to the ground, right under his nose, forcing Napoleon's retreat just as winter was setting in. Yes, the winter claimed a few of his forces. In real terms, Napoleon was defeated by the crown, that stands for the universal welfare of the nation.
the city was sacrificed for the nation. Napoleon was defeated by withholding the logistics for human existence. Napoleon had literally defeated himself. This is the ultimate fate of empire. Was this the secret Prometheus knew? In the early Greek literary tragedy, Prometheus bound, the god Prometheus is being punished not only for stealing fire and giving it to humanity, but also for thwarting plan of the god Zeus, who had aimed to obliterate the human race. Zeus is the king of the gods who ruled the Olympians of Mount Olympus with a thunderbolt in his hand. He represents empire and its power. Prometheus confesses in his contest with Zeus that the gift of fire to mankind was not his only benefaction, but that he taught men all the civilizing arts, such as writing, medicine, mathematics, astronomy, metallurgy, architecture, and agriculture. This was the gravest sin that could be committed against empire. Prometheus reveals also that he knows the secret of the ultimate demise of Zeus. Prometheus is punished for his crime with eternal torture, being chained to a rock with a bird of prey demanded to forever peck at his liver. However, he was given a choice. He would be freed if he would reveal his secret by what means Zeus will be doomed. As Prometheus refuses, an angry Zeus strikes him with a thunderbolt that plunges Prometheus into the abyss. That's as far as the play goes. But the tragedy goes on beyond what was recited in the theater. Zeus the god of Olympus found a way to ensnare humanity, the beneficiary of Prometheus, and thus to wrest away its crown that Prometheus had bestowed on it. He invented a game, a game of competition in which only one person could succeed and all others would lose, he invented the Olympics. He invented a game of competition that allows only one winner and a trail of losers which is the very opposite of the platform of civilization where the crown of humanity assures that all of humanity does win. As one would expect from the masters of empire the entire world financial and economic system has become a competition where the strongest get to win while the rest perish in the dust. Modern society has been taught to embrace the Olympics in all its forms, when ruthless financial players on the globalized scene caused the so-called Asian financial crisis in 1997, in which many Asian nations suffered huge financial and economic losses. It was said at the time in defense of the ravishing greed that the stronger players in the market have every right to be successful. The saying was countered with the question whether every person who has the means to acquire a sledgehammer has thereby the right, by his acquired might, to break down his neighbor's door and steal all his belongings. This Olympic question remains yet to be answered. Few revolutions in the world have been revolutions for civilization, empowered by the crown. That stands for the universal welfare of humanity, under which all people win, as a principle of civilization. The American Revolution was won with the crown, long before Washington had crossed over the Delaware with his troops in defense of what had been won in the heart, under the crown of humanity. The soldiers of America who were fighting in defense of the inner revolution were fighting in defense of their recognized crown, as human beings, the greatest cause for anyone to fight for. They were anti-Olympians, fighting for the universal victory of all. And they did win. The American Revolution was subsequently lost on occasions, but only to the degree to which the principle of the crown was lost sight of and the focus was shifted onto the cross, the cross of suffering under the dictates of empire. The great spiritual pioneer of America started a revolution of civilization under her own banner of the cross hewn down in the focus of the crown. She gave this symbol to humanity that guarantees a revolution of civilization, which was evidently the secret that Prometheus did not reveal, as was no one ready to hear it. Like Schiller before her, Mary Baker at presents not a sword, but the crown of humanity that encircles the cross that is thereby choked out of existence, like the shadow of a bad dream that vanishes in the sunshine of the human reality that is truly divine and reflects the creativity and the power of the universe and the nature of humanity reflected in civilization. She gave no doctrine but an outline of universal principles based on a scientific basis. The crown she gave to humanity enabled a flood of individual healing. 
She also provided a broadly outlined pedagogical structure for scientific and spiritual development, which she never articulated, which now is deemed not to even exist, and her cross and crown symbol, that she placed at the center of her seal, and put her name to it, became privatized as a commercial trademark. Nevertheless, the challenge that she presented to humanity, for it to claim its crown, which has been the challenge throughout history, remains standing today. It is also the heart of the Ice Age challenge that is unfolding before us the crown taking down the cross stands as the symbol for the platform on which all revolutions for civilization, small or tall, gain the power to succeed, and against which all future revolutions for civilization need to be measured, including the modern fight to take the economic future of humanity back out of the hands of empire, without which the Ice Age challenge will never be met.